Tonight, on Huckabee, U.S. Congressman from Tennessee, John Rose. Comedian and actress, Victoria Jackson. Juggling at a whole nother level with Ivan Pacell. And remembering Bobby Caldwell, the man and his music. That's Trey Corley and the Music City Connection. And I'm your announcer, Nan Kelly. Now, here's my... Uh, welcome, everybody. We've got a fantastic audience here, and thank all of you for joining us. Hey, if you're missing the fun of being in our studio audience, you ought to get tickets and uh, join these happy folks who are having the time of their lives here in this theater tonight. Many of you will remember, if you watched our show last week, we had the remarkable story of the Romica family from Germany, they've been in the U.S. for 15 years. Uh, they sought asylum here because the German government was going to put the parents in jail, find them, and take their children away from them for the horrific crime because the family, as devout Christian believers, wanted to homeschool their children. It was nuts. So they came here to seek asylum 15 years ago, and they've been here 15 years. They've never had to ask the taxpayers of America to give them a place to stay. They're hardworking. They're self-sufficient. Six children, wonderful family, delightful. If you haven't seen it, go back and watch it online. Well, we were here because the U.S. government, after 15 years, decided they were going to deport these guys back to Germany. And two of them have gotten married. And the two youngest were born in the U.S. They're U.S. citizens. They've born since they've been here. And they're going to make the parents go back to Germany, and when they got there, take the kids away from them. And uh, uh, this is crazy. We got millions of people coming across the southern border, and they're waved on in, no problem. And we're having to put them up in hotels and all sorts of stuff. And the government is going to deport this family back to Germany? Well, we got news about 1 o'clock this afternoon that they have been given a reprieve. They were supposed to be deported sometime this month for one more year. And hopefully, we are thanking God for it. And hopefully, somewhere between now and next year, when they're going to have to be reviewed again, we hope they can get permanent status. But I wanted to pass that on because so many people reacted very strongly to that segment. Well, let me just say this to get this right up front. I'm pretty sure that what I'm about to say is going to cause some people to get mad at me. I feel like I'm at home. <laughs> I will be probably called a rhino, which means Republican in name only, or maybe worse. I feel free. Go ahead. Call me what you want. I promise you that you can't call me anything worse than stuff I've been called for the past 33 years since I've been in politics. But it's because of my involvement in some hard-fought political battles that I'm about to offer you a perspective about the disgraceful meltdown at the House of Representatives this week in Washington. Now, unless you have been lost in a dark cave all week long, I'm sure you already know that House Speaker Kevin McCarthy was ousted this week. Congressman Matt Gates of Florida, who I've supported in the past and even held two fundraiser events in my home for his election, led seven other Republicans to join with Nancy Pelosi, AOC, the squad, Adam Schiff, Jerry Nadler, Maxine Waters, and the entire unanimous Democrat caucus to put the hit on Kevin McCarthy. Gates invoked an ill-designed rule that was part of the deal for McCarthy to become Speaker, in which only one member of the 435-member chamber could call for a vote to vacate the Speaker's office. Gates found seven Republicans who disliked McCarthy enough that they were willing to blow up the House, but to do so, they had to make a deal with the devil. You see, the entire Democrat caucus was joyfully willing to help the tiny band of the Gates gang 
to show McCarthy the door. Gates boasted that he was just more principled and pure than the Republicans who did not care for the process of publicly firing the Speaker, which is, by the way, the first time in American history it's ever happened. But let's do the math on this. 210 Republicans voted to not take a ride in the clown car and begged the Democrats for the gas to take the trip. 210. Matt Gates persuaded all of seven Republicans. That's right, seven. One might think if his ideas were so superior, he could surely get a larger number of his own party's colleagues to follow him. But he couldn't. He got seven. That's 4% of his Republican caucus, 2% of the 435 members total in the House. So if you think that those eight Republicans are the only real conservatives in Congress, then you're going to have to label Jim Jordan, Steve Scalise, James Comer, Thomas Massey, Daryl Issa, Burgess Owens, Marjorie Taylor Greene, Mark Greene, Byron Donalds, our guest John Rose, and about 200 more Republicans as being weak-kneed rhinos, which would be utter nonsense given that most of the Conservative Freedom Caucus voted with the 210, and they did not join the Democrats and Matt, Matt Gates for the coup d'etat of the Speaker. Let me be real clear. Politics isn't algebra, and it's not trigonometry. It is very simple math. 50% plus one wins. Less than that, loses. But if you've got to recruit your enemy to get you over the 50%, you're going to get what you want, which in this case was not just the ouster of a speaker, it's getting power by giving power to the party that twice impeached Donald Trump for nothing, that supports abortion up until birth, that supports a wide open border and shutting down our own energy resources so we can go and beg hostile governments for fuel and which believes in mutilating children in the name of the nonsensical transgender travesty. Those were the allies that Matt Gates partnered with in the guise of being a more pure and a more patriotic Republican than 210 of his teammates. Hey, Kevin McCarthy wasn't, isn't perfect. Maybe he didn't carry out all the agenda that he promised, but he was working with a razor thin majority with some to his left and some to his right. And then a Democrat-controlled Senate that would pretty much deep-six whatever he could get passed and sent to the Senate. And a completely addled and befuddled president who would veto any bill that Republicans liked, whether he understood it or not. And he probably wouldn't. Look, I don't agree with the socialist far-left agenda of the Democrats, but I got to admire how they publicly stick together and play team ball. Here's the fact. If you want to be a leader, you got to convince people to follow and when you can only command the following of 4% of your own team, and you've got to ask the opposing team to help you break the legs of your own quarterback because you don't like the plays he calls, you know, you might want to ask if your actions were really principled leadership or a personal and petulant tantrum that accomplished nothing but the disgust of your teammates, but the deep appreciation of your opponents. If we really do want to change the country, Folks, we just have to do better than that. It is a very special night here at the Huckabee Show for a few reasons. We are celebrating the beginning of our seventh season. That's hard to believe. We've been at this six years. The beginning of number seven. And to celebrate, we thought we'd bring back a few of our very favorite guests from previous seasons, so you are in for a real treat. Included in our celebration is music from the late, great Bobby Caldwell, who appeared on our very first season. Every note you hear tonight by the Music City Connection and Trey Corley was written by Bobby, so let's have a little fun, shall we? And by the way, sitting in for Keith Bilbrey is our dear friend Nan Kelly. Nan, welcome back. It's good to have you. And uh, Thank you, Governor. I, I bet you have some ideas on what's coming up on this show. I sure do, and the pleasure is all mine to be here, Governor. Well, coming up, more on the Madhouse in Congress with Tennessee Congressman John Rose. And later, former Georgia Congress member Doug Collins joins Mike at the desk. You don't want to miss it.
Well, welcome back. Now, the search is now on for a new Speaker of the House of Representatives. Kevin McCarthy served just over 200 days in that role, now forced out by just eight members of his own party this week. Congress is at a standstill, and they'll be voting for a new Speaker probably sometime next week. So here we go again. Our first guest tonight is a farmer, small business owner, and eighth generation Tennessean. Also happens to be the Republican Congressman for Tennessee 6th District. Please welcome back to our show, Congressman John Rose. Welcome back, Congressman. Thank you. Kind of an interesting week to have you here. It is indeed. Um, you were one of the 210, not one of the eight. Why did you side with the larger group and not the small group? Well, um, I have had a good relationship with Speaker McCarthy from the first day I arrived in Congress. Uh, he always kept his word to me and, and frankly impressed me with all that we were able to accomplish both uh, during the four years we were in the minority and then in the just the few, uh, the nine short months that we were in the majority under difficult circumstances. I thought we were moving the ball forward and, and I credit uh, Speaker McCarthy for a lot of that success. And he raised a boatload of money for all of the Republican members of Congress. And I think sometimes his fundraising uh, skills were maybe underestimated. I mean, he was something else when it came to that. He did, and that's important. It takes money to get the message out. And as Republicans, um, you know, we're often uh, laboring uh, with a press that's not as friendly to us as it is to the Democrats. What? And you mean the press is not kind to the Republicans in Washington? I'm shocked, <laughs> shocked by it all. But clearly, even if you can pass something in the House, it had better be almost just bulletproof because otherwise it's going to die a quick death in the Senate, never get to the White House for signature. And that's what all of you are having to work with. So what happens now? I mean, there have been committees that have been looking into what we kind of call the Biden crime family controversy. All of that is on hold right now because of the speaker controversy. Sure. Well, some of that will, uh, that work will continue. We have great committee chairman in Jamie Comer, uh, Jim Jordan, Jason Smith. Their work will continue, um, and they're getting to the bottom of this issue little by little. I'm trained as a lawyer, and, um, and you know, you have to go through kind of a methodical process to ferret out that information, and they've been doing that now for nine months, even really got started before we were in the majority that work can continue. Congressman, take us behind the scenes when all of this went down this week. Were, were people, were they frustrated? Were they angry? What were the emotions that people were having, both on the part of the eight and the part of the 210? Because it, it sure looked like that there was some uh, serious emotional reaction to what was going on. Absolutely. Tremendous frustration. And that frustration has been there throughout the last nine months. Uh, building at times, waning at times. Uh, we had some great successes. It brought the, the Republican conference together back in the spring when we passed the Limit Save Grow Act. Uh, but unfortunately, there were some who just could not be satisfied with forward progress. They wanted to, to make bigger steps, proceed faster. I think, frankly, they were not being realistic about the fact that Republicans control only one half of one third of government. Hmm. And I, I think that is hard for even a lot of taxpayers around the country to understand that no matter what you want to get done, you're limited by getting enough votes to get it passed. And, and to be fair, even in the Republican caucus, there are some that are a little left of maybe the speaker and some a little right of him. It's not that everybody moves in lockstep and sometimes um, everybody has to say, okay, I'm not going to get everything I want. I learned that from those great political scientists, the Rolling Stones, who sang that song. <laughs> you can't always get what you want. That's and right. I, I mean, it, it, it's just the way it works. Well, that's right. And the founders gave us this system of government. They, to some degree, wanted it to be difficult. That's why they gave us two houses of Congress, <laughs> three branches of government. They wanted the federal government in particular to move slowly and methodically, deliberately, and they achieved what they were looking for. Boy, did they ever, huh? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, but, but I think to your point, they did not want very um, tempered emotion 
to suddenly change the direction of the country because it might be an emotional reaction rather than a thoughtful and, again, a methodical one. And, uh, you know, the Senate originally was sort of like the saucer in which the hot cup of coffee was cooled off. Um, I'm not sure that anything gets cooled off in Washington <laughs> these days, does it? Certainly with the very short news cycles and social media, it has really heightened, I think, the hyperbole, the, the, the emotions and how quickly things move and makes it difficult to be as thoughtful and judicious in the actions that you take. We just have a few seconds left, less than a minute, but I want to ask before we go, this week, President Biden, who said he would not build one foot of the wall, now is going to build 20 miles and pretends that he doesn't have any choice. He has to do it. But he's ignored a lot of other things. He's, he's actually suspending 26 laws to say that he's got to carry this one out. What's going on with the White House? And now they suddenly realize we do have a disaster at the border. I think you see him responding to the American people. The vast majority, 70, 80 percent of the American people recognize that we have a crisis at the southern border I think this president is slowly coming to that realization. Encouragement from many members of his own party who have come to recognize the, the difficulties of having 7 million people come into the country illegally uh, in a very short period of time. And so I think the president's woken up to that. I will say from visiting the southern border to a number, to a person, the southern border patrol officers say the wall works and, mm -hmm. they, and they'd like to see it completed. I think they would probably know a little bit more about it than President Biden, who has never been to the border to see it firsthand. So let's hope he maybe follows your lead and goes. Congressman, I want to say thanks, not just for being here. Thanks for taking the values of being a farmer, small business owner, an attorney. It's the kind of background that we need for people to have in Congress, making decisions that understand what those decisions will do to the folks back home. And we're grateful and glad you're there. Thanks for joining us again here on the show. Thank you, Governor. Thank you, Tavid. Thank you. Now, you can follow a congressman on social media, and I hope you will. If you'll head over to Huckabee.tv, we'll get you links directly to the congressman's office and his social media. Right now, Nan Kelly is going to tell our viewers what we've got coming up next, and it's good, I promise. Sure is. Up next, Victoria Jackson is back. And it looks like she brought her ukulele. And a little later on, you'll never look at juggling the same thanks to the amazing Ivan Passell. You're watching Huckabee. Welcome back. That was Open Your Eyes by John Legend, written by the great Bobby Caldwell and performed by Trey Corley in the Music City Connection. You know, Trey, I know that you and Bobby became friends after he was on the show. Just what did Bobby mean to you? I know you're doing a special tribute to him tonight. Man, that would take a long time, but short and sweet. Uh, uh, definitely learning chords. I got to share with him that one of the ways I learned some of my cool chords was what you won't do from love, what you won't do for love. And uh, Bobby Caldwell, when I told him the stories about it, we just shared how, man, I learned some really cool stuff from him. He didn't even know it. So when I found out he was going to be on the show for the first time, Governor, I, I'm, I'm not going to lie. Man, I was like messed up getting to play with him. It was a blast. So um, just sharing music. It's great how music truly transcends, man. You don't even, we didn't decide who, you know, what he was looking at, what he liked. We just loved music. It was a great connection. Such a cool dude. He really, really was a cool dude. That's an understatement. Well, speaking of cool people, I'm always happy when this lady comes back to visit us. America first fell in love with her during her 20 appearances with Johnny Carson and then her six seasons on Saturday Night Live. You know, that show that used to be funny. Uh, <laughs> well, she stepped away from Hollywood to focus on her faith and family but she's still entertaining us from her wonderful children's songs, stand-up tours, and her books. 
including one called Lavender Hair about her victory over breast cancer. Please welcome back our favorite ukulele lady, Victoria Jackson. <laughs> What a great song to bring you up with, right? Isn't she lovely? Thank you, thank you. I see you brought your ukulele with you. Yeah. Come on up. I don't wear Where high heels anymore, so I was... I don't either. I'm yeah, being very careful. Those are high heels, darling. I don't know if you know that, but I don't know how you'd walk in in those things. When you're over 60, it's really hard. <laughs> but I'm still in show business! Yes, you are. <laughs> <laughs> You're the new Johnny Carson. Oh, oh see, look. there he is right there, up look there on the screen. That. How about that? You're going to do a song for us, aren't you? Yeah, I was just seeing how fat I look in the monitor. <laughs> you look beautiful. You look absolutely lovely. Thank you, Governor. You look fantastic. Thank you. If but, we just sit here and keep complimenting each other, well, but it'll see, be good for both of us. But you're lying, and I'm not, because men look better the older they get, right? Really? Ah. It's not fair. Ah, I, I've never been told that. People usually come up and say, I thought you were dead. So, <laughs> <laughs> but you're doing, a, I know you're doing stand up and you're doing a lot of comedy, but you're focusing a whole lot on music these days, right? Oh, yes. Well, since I moved to Nashville, you know, everybody has a. Good move. Um, everybody has a recording studio in their house. Yeah. And so my friend Jim McBurney, I said, I really want to make a CD of the songs I've written since I moved here. And I moved here 11 years ago. And when, after I moved here, my mom died, my dad died, my brother died, I got cancer, and my three dogs died. Other than that, it's been a great 11 years, huh? Yeah. Well, you see, that's a lot of, that gives you good material. Yeah. Because I think all good art comes from pain. Mm. Right. Well, we ought to hear some good art then. You've got something for us? So all my songs, like, yeah, I want to sing you a song. Okay. And I appreciate you letting me, because a lot of people don't want to hear me sing. Well, we do. Thank you. We do. But, um, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Uh, okay, okay. Egg her on. Come on. All right. <laughs> okay, so this one's called Lavender Hair. Okay, so my hair was growing back in, and it, looked gray, and I said to my friend Judy, my hair's growing back in gray. And she goes, no, it looks lavender. And so my husband kind of picked up on, oh, that, that'll make her feel good. Yeah, yeah, Vicki, it looks lavender, it looks lavender, because he, he didn't know how to make me feel pretty. But so he kind of jumped on that compliment. So then I, it inspired this song. He sees me as optic, not heavy. He hears me as wise and not dull. He thinks that I'm super terrific When others think nothing at all He sees me as funny, not silly And graceful as Fred Astaire And he doesn't notice the gray He said I have lavender hair Like you have a lavender beard Is that what that is? <laughs> is that what it is? He... Um, and cleans up my mess in the kitchen. He irons his clothes and mine too. He's shy, but he'll get on the dance floor if that's what I want him to do. His kisses are soft and yet manly. Manly. He mentions me in his prayer and he doesn't notice the gray. He said I have lavender hair. All alone in the moonlight, stars watch from above. One says, they're starting to look alike. The other, other says, could this be love? Sometimes we strongly disagree about money with our fists in a ball. But he is the only honey I want to cuddle by the fire in the fall. I never said he was perfect. His romantic gestures are very, whoops, romantic gestures are very, very rare. 
but he doesn't notice the gray. He said, I have lavender hair. That's beautiful. <laughs> Victoria Jackson for her tour schedule, music, social media, and a whole lot more. Go to Huckabee.tv. Now, Nan, tell us what we have coming up next. We'll do next. Former Georgia Congressman Doug Collins is in the studio. We pay tribute to the life and music of Bobby Caldwell tonight. Don't go away. You're watching Huckabee. Well, one of my very favorite people, Doug Collins, happens to be with us tonight. He is a former congressman from Georgia and one of the most pleasant people to watch when he was uh, conducting televised hearings when he was in Congress. This week, we know that history was made in the House with an ouster of Kevin McCarthy as Speaker, but it's a chaotic part of our history and it all could just lead maybe to more problems, could be gridlock, but one thing won't be gridlock. Anytime Doug Collins shows up, we're going to have a good time. Please welcome back to our show in Nashville, Doug Collins, host of the Doug Collins Podcast. Good to have you here. Glad to be here. Your home state of Georgia yes. is uh, the, kind of the uh, center of the world when it comes to let's go and prosecute Donald Trump. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of a nutty thing that we're watching unfold. This is a prosecutor, Fannie Willis, who was determined to find something, mm -hmm. and she's indicted him. What do the people of Georgia think about all this? They're tired of it. They really are. And I think when you look at it from the perspective of, you know, let's look at the you're breaking down the case as it goes. I mean, are you, is it okay now to question, you know, and ask questions? It seemed to be all right for Stacey Abrams and everybody else to do it. Yeah. Um, but, you know, again, this is the problem that we're having. You look at all the cases, uh, Mike. And Governor, we look at this from New York to, to the Jack Smith, all this. It is just, you know, they're taking a, a unique concept and saying, well, we're going to prosecute you for it. We're going to do this in Georgia. You ask about this, and we're going to get into your mind, and we know what you were thinking. Mm. That's not the, what the prosecutors ought to be doing. And I think the people in Georgia are tired. They're tired of watching it. They're tired of it being the center of attention. You're also an attorney. So do you think former President Trump can get a fair trial in Atlanta? Is it possible? It's possible because here's the one thing that everybody needs to remember. All the things that have been said so far have came from one side. Yeah. It's the prosecuting side. They've had every audience. They've had every grand jury. They've been able to present everything. And for those of us who know him real well, when he gets to present his side, there's a totally different, there's at least there's going to be the other side is going to be heard, and he'll let himself be heard. Well, I don't think there's any doubt about that. Um, this week, I, I was talking to Congressman Rose earlier sure. about the goings-on. When you were watching this from a distance, having been a member of Congress, what was your reaction to all of it that was going on? I was sad. I mean, I, I want to just bring out a couple of points to, to everybody listening. Since 2010, Republicans have had the speakers. Uh, we've been in control eight, I think, of those four years, 12 years. We have taken three speakers. We've run two of them off and voted one out. Every one of them. Yeah. Okay, mainly for I don't like, you didn't do what I wanted you to do kind of thing. We've got to get back to a point in which, uh, and I know from my, our, my pastor and background, yours as well, we've got to not divorce real life and politics. Yeah. Folks, real life and politics are same. If you're in real life and you're working to negotiate to get the best deal you can, that's exactly what you should expect members of Congress to do. Instead of grandstanding and going for the five-minute video or the clicks, let's say how about actually working for the American people, finding the most conservative thing you can get, get that, and then follow the old Reagan platform. I'll come back and get the other 20% later. You know, I, I've often said to people, particularly when they're new into politics, I said, let me just say this to you. If you have the view that it's all or nothing, now or never, you'll get nothing, and you'll get it forever. Because yep. it's not like that. It's, it's inch by inch. That's how it works. But, and, but we've been, t unfortunately, and, I, and I'll say this with love, because I am one of conservative. We've been telling people things that we couldn't do. Hmm. And I think this is a problem. You can't, it's, it's not that you can't get stuff done, but when you tell them, you make a comment. I, I meant before, we said, oh, we're going to do away with Obamacare. 
Okay, well, you had a Senate that was Democrat, you had the president whose name is on it, but we're not going to do away with it. Yeah. And it but in four, six years, we gutted Obamacare with eight different bills. It basically gutted it. But we couldn't run on that because we told everybody that we had people saying, oh, we're going to do away with it. We've got to get back again to what I said about reality and say, okay, here's what we're going to get. We're going to say, we're going to push for border security, and we're going to get this, and we're going to make the Senate give us something back. Then we're going to negotiate it, and we're going to come to an agreement. And then we're going to go back and do it again the next time. That's the only way this country is going to be saved if we actually have people who are willing to commit long term to dealing with the issues we have. And I think what you just said is something we need to remind ourselves of. It is a long term. Yes. It does, it's not an event. It is a process. And the process is not quick. It takes time and it does happen little by little, not all at once. It is. We've become such a microwave society. We expect it now. We expect it if I stand up on and do a YouTube video saying, this is what I will do. I mean, think about this. And for everybody in a relationship out there, everybody who has a job, if you just walked into your relationship and my beautiful bride is here tonight and 35 years old, I heard a 60-year-old here. This is amazing. We're trying, okay? We're trying. <laughs> um, you know, You'll make it. <laughs> yeah, we get it. But if I went in and told her, I will not, do this. I will not take the trash. I will not do this. I will not. That won't last very long. Yeah. At least on my house. That five foot two would get on me. But we're doing, if you do that in politics, it's the same way. Yeah. Well, you wouldn't see her for a couple of weeks. Then the swelling would go down. Yeah. You could peep through and <laughs> see just there? a bit. <laughs> Doug, it's great having you here. Always thank you. Always I wish you were still in Congress because you were <laughs> incredibly that. effective. And I hope you're not finished running for something. I truly do. Thank you. Be sure to check out the Doug Collins podcast and follow him on social media. We've got the links to all of that at our site, Huckabee.tv. Right now, Nan Kelly is going to tell all of you where you should go to get their very own Huckabee gear. And we got some, too. That's right. Sure thing, Governor. New season, new store. Head to Huckabee.tv for all your favorite Huckabee gear. Proudly made in the USA. We'll be right back. Well, welcome back. Now, when we ask ourselves, which dangerous juggler should we bring back? Everyone on the show agreed. Well, everyone except Trey. And there is a reason that Trey has some nightmares of Ivan's first appearance. Watch. That right there explains why Trey gets nervous whenever Ivan Pessel returns. Ivan's act has taken him all over the world, but right now it has brought him back to us. Strap on your helmet, Trey, as we welcome back Ivan Pessel. Oh, wow. Thank you. Thank you, Governor. Thank you so much. What an honor it is to be performing on the Best of Huckabee Show. You know, this is actually my third appearance on the program. I was first on virtually during COVID, then I came back in 2021, and now in 2023. And I'll tell you, I will keep coming back as long as they keep blackmailing me. I, uh, you know, I, I do have other gigs, but I also don't want them to release the photos. So here I am, everybody. Now, I'm going to start off by sharing with you one of my favorite juggling tricks, all right? So what I'm going to attempt to do right now is balance one of these three clubs on my forehead, drop it back behind myself, kick it back up over my head, and resume a basic juggling pattern. Now, typically in my shows, I perform this trick using three flaming torches, but unfortunately, I'm no longer allowed to perform that. <laughs> Since the trial. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, some, some of you laughed a little too hard at that, kind of disturbing, that's fine. It's a, all right, now this is a very difficult trick, so if I do mess up, doesn't really matter, because either way, you can't do it. <laughs> I'm just serious. All right. Now, I don't know if you're all aware of this, but this is actually a standard sobriety test in California. So it's really cracking down. All right, here we go. 
Yeah, that means clap along, I'm not a seal. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, everybody. I'm, I'm extremely talented. Thank you. <laughs> That's very, you know, uh, as Governor mentioned, my last appearance on the program, uh, my main man, Trey, over there, bravely laid on the floor and let me juggle knives walking over the top of them. And after the show aired, when I got home, I got so many phone calls and emails about the routine. And I uh, gotta be honest, man, a lot of them were, they were a little mean, Trey, and I, but I thought you'd get a kick out of them, so I actually brought a couple uh, to read to you. I, I, these are funny. I think you're going to get a kick out of these. Uh, this first one, uh, I could literally see Trey shaking with fear like a frightened little baby. <laughs> I, <laughs> I think he peed a little. I did, okay. Uh, yeah, he's like, <laughs> after receiving like six or seven of these, I had to kindly ask the governor to stop messaging me. <laughs> hey. So how do I top last year's performance? I'm gonna show you right now. For your amusements, I am now going to attempt to juggle this bowling ball, this razor sharp hatchet, and this raw egg. But no reaction for the bowling ball or the ax, but the egg gets a ooh. Priorities, people. I could crush my bones. I could slice off a limb. But ooh, he could get messy. <laughs> and to make this trick even more difficult than it already is, ladies and gentlemen, I will also attempt to juggle these three objects, balanced atop this. Okay, 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 just, okay. Trey, stop squirming, sir, please, just sit still, please, just sit. Just close your eyes and go to your happy place. It's, it's the best, I feel, it's, okay, you just, uh, it's like Cirque du Soleil here, only crappier. Really, it's... Uh, what? <laughs> what? This is silky and smooth. This, yes. Do they make this conditioner for men, I wonder? It's, uh, no. Seriously, everybody, come here, feel this. You got, it's, uh, I'm just doing my Joe Biden impression. <laughs> Excuse me. Okay. Everybody give Trey a big round of applause. What a guy. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. No more. Don't. Thanks for not pressing charges ahead of time. Now, to end this, this show off with a bang here, Governor, this is the best of your show. Yeah. I am going to give you the best seat in the house for this oh. next routine. And yeah. It's funny when it's not oh, you. Oh, I love yeah. this much better. Yeah. <laughs> So, Governor, I am going to juggle the bowling ball and the axe and the yeah. egg. Uh, for safety's sake, I am going to have you go ahead and, and move on over to the couch. I you think know. that's a great idea. If it goes wrong, I, <laughs> yeah, I, I don't want something to go bad and you get the bowling ball. And yeah. I definitely don't want you to get the axe. Absolutely not. <laughs> like Speaker McCarthy. <laughs> <laughs> Boom! Comedy jokes! All right. All right. No, Governor, uh, thank you so much for moving. I uh, yeah. don't want you to feel like you got kicked out of your own office. <laughs> Happy to leave. <laughs> like Pelosi. <laughs> Boom, two for two. All right, here we go. <laughs> thank you very much. Oh, 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 oh. That is awesome. If you want to see more of Ivan Fussell and book him for your special event, visit Huckabee.tv and we will toss you the links. Man, Kelly, keep an eye on this guy, but if you survive that segment, tell us a little bit about next week's show. You got it, Governor. Simply amazing. Please join us next week as TVN host Rabbi Jason Sobel talks about his new book and the Flat River Band will bring us beautiful family harmony. We'll be right back.
Back in 2018, the great Bobby Caldwell joined us to perform his classic hit, What You Won't Do For Love. He was one of the most successful pop and R&B singer-songwriters of all time, and just happened to be one of our very favorite musical segments to have him here. He also wrote songs for many artists, including Boz Skaggs, Neil Diamond, Al Jarreau, Roberta Flack, the band Chicago, Natalie Cole, and the number one hit, The Next Time I Fall. He wrote that for Amy Grant and Peter Cetera. Tragically, last March, Bobby passed away, but his musical legacy lives on, guided by his wife and longtime music business partner, Mary, as well as his daughter, Katie. Here to help us celebrate Bobby Caldwell's remarkable life and unforgettable music, please welcome Mary Caldwell and Katie Moriarty. Ar Ma Mor Ar Moriarty. I know, I know how to do it, Moriarty. It's so good to have both of you here. It's great to be here. Broke our hearts when Bobby passed away, and I can't even imagine the grief that you guys have gone through. But it has to make you feel good that there's continuous love and outpouring of appreciation for Bobby's life and his career. It does. In fact, when he passed, um, it was March 14th, and the next morning, I just posted a little Twitter blurb, you know, that he had passed, and I could not believe mm. every media outlet in the country and even around the globe acknowledged, you know, paid tribute to him. So. But so many people in the music industry, I mean, they have used his material, done the music that he wrote. A lot of people probably didn't even realize that Bobby Caldwell was the writer of so many of the songs that they grew up listening to. Uh, it, they certainly knew him for his own work, but, you know, he had such a prolific talent of writing songs that other artists, the top artists in the world, would take and, and record. That has to make you feel good. You're driving down the road, you listen to the radio, and all of a sudden one of his songs comes up. Oh, yeah, that happens daily. Yeah. It's really comforting, you know. Katie, you and your mom have spent a lot of Bobby's last uh, year or so of life putting aside a lot of your own personal things to take care of him and to, uh, you know, to make sure that he was surrounded by family and by love. But yet that must have been a hard time for you to say, you know, I'm just going to focus on my dad and, and spend that time. Yeah, it was, uh, it was really difficult, you know. Um, he had a lot of health issues going on, but you, you always look back and you think of the great memories. And no matter what, we would all sit around the TV watch some of our favorite shows, and he would always tune my guitar for me. <laughs> and I swear no one will tune it better than, than the way he did. So well, definitely miss him a lot. You know, I think that having Bobby Caldwell tune your guitar would be a pretty cool thing, and I'm pretty positive it would always be in tune in the right way. Oh, uh, do you have a favorite song, Mary, of, of all he did? I mean, he's got such a huge catalog of, of songs. But what is the favorite of yours? It depends on the category, but really an unknown song called Never Take a Chance. Never Take a Chance. There, there's a ton of songs yeah. that literally have never been heard. But, of course, I've heard them all. Will you try to make sure that those songs get out into the marketplace and into the hands of an artist? We're trying. It's a tall order, but... Um, any artist out there want to cover a song? I think, do it. you know what? I can't imagine that somebody would not want to take one of the Bobby Caldwell written songs and make a hit out of it, which would be pretty solid Well, to you do. know, a lot of the rap artists, believe it or not, um, breathe life into some of his songs. Yeah, no, I Tupac, don't doubt that. Biggie Smalls, yeah. Common, yeah. All my, those are all my peeps, you know, <laughs> people I hang out with. Well, Nan, while we get ready to set up the salute to the fantastic music of Bobby Caldwell, I want you to tell our viewers where they can learn more about his music, his life, and his legacy. Sure thing, Governor. To learn more about the great Bobby Caldwell, just follow the links over at Huckabee.tv. Now, here to perform a very special tribute to Bobby Caldwell, please show some love for Trey Corley and the Music City Connection. <laughs> Again. Only meant 
Love 